she's going, it's a woman from PBS in Arkansas. She's going to help us learn how to navigate uh, sharing stories under two minutes, little snippets and how to post them on their website and stuff. It's really cool. So later today, I will upload the video of the class onto our website and you can visit there and see what the class was like. Um, she kind of spent today exploring the website of American PBS Portrait so that uh, you could see what other people's stories looked like. We're really excited to have, you know, new people from who don't normally teach at LifeQuest come and do stuff for us. And so it's always a lot of fun. Today, we're gonna have Sandra Cohn teach about techniques in art and she's taught many classes for us before. Uh, we're excited to have her join us here in a second. We've got a couple of minutes still before class. We just, um, we're trying to get into the habit of sharing this screen with you so that we can thank our corporate sponsors for making um, the summer classes free and available to everyone so that we can continue our education throughout the summer and uh, expose more people to LifeQuest through the free classes and get them all excited about the fall term because you'll all know how to use Zoom and know how to unmute yourselves and type in the comments or be familiar with it. So when fall comes around, uh, you'll be super psyched because you'll be ahead of the curve by taking all these free classes. All right. We've got just another minute and I see that Sandra's joined us in the office, which is nice. Sandra uh, is coming to us from the office. She wasn't sure about the uh, internet connection at her house and stuff. And so uh, we just have limited staff at the office at this time. I haven't been in the office except two days since March 18th. And uh, Leah just rarely pops into the office. And so this is a real, learning, it's been fun learning how to do work from home. <laughs> awesome. Hi, Sandra. I'm going to go ahead and unmute you so you can say hi. Hello, everyone. Good to see you. This is a real different experience for all of us. <laughs> hey, Leah. <laughs> I just met you. <laughs> Dina, I'm going to um, make sure I know where, how to help her share her screen, her PowerPoint. So we're going to get that up right now. Okay. Do you want to do that for her, Leah, and she can give her background? There it is. Thank you. I encourage you all, um, if you have a question, go ahead and maybe type it in the chat, or if you know how to raise your electronic blue hand, I'll be watching for little blue hands. And um, that way we can, you know, interrupt Sandra when appropriate. Okay, can Wendy, I'm not seeing it. It keeps getting me back to the sponsor page. That's the sponsor page. So maybe I didn't close it. Maybe that's why it's not. So when I go to share my her screen, I'm going to troubleshoot from El Paso. So the sponsor screen is in PowerPoint, and so you may want to close that PowerPoint so that you can open her PowerPoint and then share that. One. And um, Sandra, you're muted again right now. But when you do speak to class, you might want to uh, sit a little closer to the computer so that your voice is loud and clear. We are looking at getting an external microphone for the office, um, but we want uh, everybody to be able to enjoy you today. I'm going to admit a couple of more people and give me a thumbs up if you're ready for her to be unmuted. Nope, no thumbs up yet. <laughs> Thank you all for your patience. <laughs> I guess I should just wait for her to share her screen and then we'll know she's ready to go. All right. Sandra has taught lots of art classes before, for us before. And um, 
just in all sorts of ways. She's got her own following. People know that when she's teaching a class, they want to go. <laughs> I see Janet shaking her head yes. I see Anne, and she's in that boat. She's in the Sandra's teaching. I got to go to that class boat. <laughs> Big thumbs up. I'm here. We're ready to go. Awesome. Okay. I'm going to mute myself and let you introduce yourself then. So some of you, some of you already know me. I am Sandra McCullough Cone, but those of you who don't, here's my little introductory slide. Um, I'm a visual learner, um, I, so I teach with visuals. I'm originally from Little Rock. I currently live in Little Rock. I've traveled extensively and lived other places, but my husband and I live not far from Second Press. So um, I got my master's degree in art history at UALR. Um, and I attended the University of Kansas working on a doctorate degree, but it was too hard living away from home. So we'll see about that. That's for another time. My first degree was as a registered nurse and I have worked as a registered nurse. ER nursing was my particular love. And um, I love to travel. And uh, I'm telling you this COVID is just kicking my butt over travel restrictions, but you know, we've all got to be safe. We've got to do the best we can. So and the other passion I have among many others is cats. So, um, you know, so I have four currently at home and uh, their characters. So we'll move on to the class. So which exams. Um, well, it's not moving. Gina, can't, here we go. If you have not please attend the Zoom orientation class. It's on Mondays at 11 o'clock. You learn how to raise your hand to make a comment on class content. This will help your enjoyment and your participation. You can even learn how to pass a note to another student, just like in school without your teacher knowing about it. So I hope to keep the content part of class to 30 to 40 minutes in length and have time for questions afterwards. We have a monitor today. It's Gina to help answer questions. Um, consider keeping a notepad so you can jot down any questions for question time. And please, please, let's all be patient with each other. Zoom as a teaching method is very new to all of us. I'm going to do a brief review of the most common techniques in drawing, painting, printmaking, and sculpture. Um, and um, this will give us insight into the artist because certain techniques have certain advantages and certain drawbacks. And I've learned in some of my more historically oriented classes that I say, oh, this is a, an engraving that not knowing what that means has been a, kind of a, a difficulty. So we're going to gain some insights here. And um, but I want to tell you this. This is one of my favorite quotes from Pablo Picasso. Some painters transform the sun into a yellow spot. Others transform the yellow spot into the sun. And it's that something that, that unless you are able to do that yellow spot into the sun, that's just undefinable for most of us. But understanding what the advantages to watercolor is or what the advantages to oil painting is um, helps us understand what the artist is trying to convey. So the first thing we're going to talk about is drawing. Um, I love this special print, you know, um, he always likes to play with, you know, your mind a little with his drawings. And I love this, the hand drawing itself. And, you know, which one's the actual drawing hand and which is the hand drawing. But first thing to say about drawing is it's intimate and familiar because everyone draws. If you doodled on a pad, you've drawn. You may not draw well, I certainly don't, but everyone draws. It's intimate because it's often the artist's note taking, rapidly done and not intended to be exhibited. Also, they're often small in size, like a notebook page. So you have to get close to see it. And that creates a sense of intimacy, kind of a glimpse into the artist's, um, artist's ideas. And it's very familiar because it uses very commonplace materials, especially today. So we're going to start with the functions of drawing, and I'll try to stop at the end of every topic to check for questions so that we don't get a big backlog. Okay, um, this is fascinating to me, and the great thing is, is uh, Picasso knew he was doing an important work of 
art. Um, so he saved every one of his compositional studies for the very famous painting, Guernica. Um, he started out May 1st, and you know, it doesn't look much like the painting to me, but by, by May 9th, he had um, one of his, he had many of the main ideas of the painting fleshed out, the bull, the woman um, screaming overhead like she's coming into the picture, the dead figures at the bottom, uh, the grieving mother is not apparent yet, but we will look at the finished painting in a moment and you'll see the um, thing. So here is one function of drawing, which is to capture that first idea. You know, he just, he got his idea and he grabbed a, pen, a pencil and pad and started jotting down things. Kind of a shorthand probably for him, especially in this first study. But he starts May 1st, 1937. And here is the completed painting. It was first shown at the Spanish Pavilion at the World's Fair in Paris. It was completed June 4th, 1937. And I find most of my LifeQuest audience are very knowledgeable about history and current events, but perhaps you are not familiar with them. Um, Franco was having a war. There was a war in Spain between um, Republican forces and uh, the forces, the fascist forces of Franco. Hitler was building up his army, um, building it up creating new, building new planes, new weapons, and he wanted to test them. So Franco assigned the town of Guernica, which had never been, um, had no military value. And then he, um, he gave Hitler permission to bomb it. And it had never been touched by the military. They weren't expecting the bombing. So Hitler's um, Air Force came in and just decimated the town. And it was an outrage. If you think about our response to September the 11th, that was the world's response to this. So you see these figures, um, you start to see how they came together. This painting is currently in Madrid. Um, it has the entire floor, third floor of a museum dedicated to it and all the compositional studies are there. So it's fascinating. But look how quickly he completed it. By June 4th, this entire painting was done. It helped that it was a monochromatic composition. He didn't have to mix colors or, you know, but it's quite large. And um, one of my favorite things, and I have never found a photograph of it, they have a, um, a model of the Spanish pavilion and they show you how Guernica was exhibited. Um, this is a world famous painting. And, uh, I think it's probably one of the most impressive of Picasso's works. So in the second function of drawing is to create an inventory of figures and poses for later works. Many, many artists did this. Uh, Rubens, Peter Paul Rubens, spent quite a bit of time in Rome and Italy, and he went and saw classical sculptures. He saw the Renaissance sculptures and works um, of Michelangelo, Leonardo, Raphael, and he did drawings and he took them home. And when he returned to Antwerp, he used many of them as suggestions. Um, if you know what you're looking for, you can spot them. But here is one by Edgar, Edgar Degas. As many of you know, he painted many, many of the ballerinas. And here's one adjusting her slipper. He would watch them practice. This is 1873. It's graphite charcoal on a pink and Pete Pastel on paper. We'll talk about those things in a few minutes. Um, very much, very evocative. But you can see the skirt is just suggested with the whole pose, the movement. And I, I, I would promise you, we could search through his paintings and probably find this pose for um, to compare to this drawing that he would keep on when he think, oh, didn't I paint? A, because he would paint separate from the place, the practice sessions, or the stage where he saw these things. And another function was to investigate the world. And Leonardo da Vinci had a voracious curiosity about the world. And um, paper was actually quite expensive at this time. So you notice he didn't waste much space. Um, we're very familiar with his notepad, his notebooks. And here is um, his Star of Bethlehem and Other Plants. 
It's a red chalk and a pen. Um, and they have an inquisitive and inquisitive mind, Grandma wrote. Um, many of these drawings have his actual fingerprints on them because he would touch them and shade and smudge. We'll talk about that a little bit more when we get into the actual tools. So these are the functions of drawing. Does anyone have a question at this point? Speak up. You can ask at the end if it occurs to you later, but I'm gonna move on then. So drawing, we can divide the materials in drawing into dry and liquid. So we're gonna start with the dry medium. This includes pencil, charcoal, Conti crayon, and pastels. Each type produces a very different type of line. So which one used is chosen by the artist because he, he or she wishes to produce a certain type of line and they might change them up in the drawings. You know, they might use, as we saw with Degas, he used pencil and sometimes he used chalk. So sometimes a pastel. The darkness and the line quality are determined by the degree of hardness and texture and the texture of the drawing surface. You know, um, a crayon, a Crayola crayon makes a very different line than a very sharp, hard pencil. Um, you know that from your own personal life experience. This is pencil, we'll start with that. It's the most common, the most inexpensive, very, very familiar to all of us. That number two pencil we know well. Artists have a bigger range of pencils. Um, that give the, and the softness of the hardness produces a different line. This is a portrait of the very famous violinist Paganini. Um, he was basically the Leo, um, excuse me, the Yo-Yo Ma of the 19th century. And he was a personal friend of the artist. And um, I think he can really, he really captures a sense of personality. Notice the head and face are much more finely worked and completed. He probably switched out hardnesses of, hardness of pencil to get those very delicate lines of the violin bow and yet the heavier texture of the hair. Um, he was a rock star of his time, Paganini. This is a very impressive work at first. I suspect you kind of go with a spider web. Um, and it is. It is produced with charcoal which is charred wood. Um, the ones the artists use today are a little bit more sophisticated rendered than just burning a piece of wood, but nonetheless, you know, the charcoal, you can, I guess, use the charcoal wood kits that you barbecue with, but it's not going to give you the same quality. It creates a wide range of values from light to dark. It's a very soft line and it can smudge easily and easily erased. And that's the other thing about pencil I forgot to mention. It's very forgiving. Um, you make a mistake, you get your eraser out. You know, I can certainly relate to that. Remember, I'm doing algebra. I changed those answers a few times. What I find really amazing about this particular piece of art is that the black parts is the charcoal. The white lines are the paper showing through. Um, I think you can see as a technique that is much more complicated than perhaps your first impression was when you looked at and of course the spider web is an amazing work of art just in nature itself but like I said for for, for the first glance you don't realize that the white is the paper showing through and just how delicate a touch you must have used in these very narrow spaces and chalk Gosh, the artists have used chalk probably since the first um, humans went into the caves because it's easily made from earth minerals, easily found. Typically comes in three colors for artists, black, red, and white. They often combine those colors to create an image. It blends well and smudges easily. Here is Leonardo's study for the Madonna of the Yarnwinder using primarily red chalk, but again, notice the picture, the, the silhouettes over on the, the your left-hand side, um, where he's working out some ideas, and then he, he really is working on the face in this, look at the very delicate shading, and um, just beautiful, and these papers, um, you find, even on his paintings, he was a tactile artist, and he would touch it, 
we have his actual fingerprints in the, um, in, because he, he put his fingers in his oil paints. Um, I'm told that the, the notebooks that uh, the queen owns, that she keeps at Windsor Castle, that there's actually skin cells on the pages. So, you know, many people speculate that we could draw DNA and know something about Leonardo. I don't know. He was a fantastic artist in drawing. I mean, he really had a knack for it. I, I, I admire his paintings, but his graphic works, um, and if you ever see them, you really, in person, you can see where he's touched them and he smoothed out the shaded areas on her shoulder, you know, in the curve of her neck, those were all probably blended with his fingers. And um, so it, this is what we're talking about being an intimate art drawing because, you know, he, he had a very direct connection to the page. Okay, Conte crayon. Now these aren't like the Crayola crayons. You can go to any store and quickly and easily buy. This is um, a different kind of crayon. It has a binder. It's chalk, and the binder they use creates the crayon. The most common for artists to use is the Conte crayon. It's a very finely textured crayon. It comes in shades of red, brown, and black. It is used primarily for preliminary drawings, and it creates a very soft, textured appearance. In addition to that, um, Georges Seurat used a textured paper, so you get a real sense of texture with these figures of Perrault and Columbine, which were puppet characters. Um, so, again, we would probably find that this was these appear in a full painting of his. He was obsessive about working out um, his compositions before. We have a lot of his drawings. Unfortunately, uh, Seurat died fairly young, so we don't, and he did large scale paintings in a technique called pointillism that is time consuming. So his, um, his works, his major oil paintings, we don't have as many of it. If you've ever been to Chicago, you've probably seen one of his most famous paintings, which is Sunday afternoon on the Grand Jot, which shows Parisians taking their leisure time. And pastels, one of my favorite medium, and this is by Edgar Degas. Pastels, um, until really the late 19th century and 20th century, the artists created their own, and I have been told that Degas had a special recipe for his pastels that gave it a luminous glow. Um, here is a singer in green from 1884. Again, she would have been an opera singer. Um, you know, the ballet would sometimes combined with opera. And as you can see how, you know, the good thing about pastel is it comes in a wide variety of colors. The previous things we've looked at, charcoal, pencil, the contact crayon, they don't have a wide range of colors. So they combine chalk with a binder, such as gum arabic, and it comes in, like I said, it blends very well. It creates shading. You can see the modeling, the hollows, at her neck, you know, and the, the, the shadow of her chin. It's just beautifully done. He's really captured her in this moment of, you know, you can tell she's hitting that perfect note. You know, she's waiting for, she's reaching out to her audience. And just, just a beautiful work. And notice she's far more finished than the background. Um, the fascinating thing about pastels, it's often considered a borderline medium, that there's aspects of painting and drawing in their compositions. So we're going to talk about liquid media, which is primarily ink. It's the tool used to create the work that um, creates the major differences. So I'll take a quick look at the time. And while I'm doing that, let me ask if there are any questions. Gina, is anybody raising a hand? Or I haven't seen anybody raise a hand yet or uh, put any questions in the chat, but if you do, go ahead and unmute yourself real quick. Liquid media. 
here is Rembrandt, again, another artist that was a virtuoso in the graphic arts, which uh, pen, pencil, um, you think of drawing, uh, printmaking, uh, these kind of things. And he was really very, very skilled. As skilled as he was as an, a um, painter, he, he was excellent as well on the smaller works. And you use pen and ink, much like the old fashioned, you know, pens, like a fountain pen today. And ink provides a smooth, uninterrupted, uninterrupted line. However, there's very little room for correction. Unlike pencil, you can't go in and erase. So you have to make lemonade out of your lemons if you make mistakes. The pinpoint, the nib of the pen determines the thickness of line. And, you know, they might switch them out. They might not. Now, this is a pen and brown ink brush and brown wash. So he used a brush and he diluted the ink with water and then applied it over the painting to give areas of darkness. And you can see this. Again, this is a lovely work. And very, very much a personal. Um, and keep in mind, in the 17th century, they did not take their canvases out to paint. Um, we'll talk about that when we talk, a little bit more when we talk about watercolor in the next lecture. Um, he would take a sketch pad and a pencil, maybe his ink, you know, water's easily available, especially in the Netherlands. So he would go out and do these little drawings and he might take this home, turn it into a painting. He might sell it as a finished work. He might turn it into a print. Um, very versatile artist, Rembrandt. And of course, he had numerous students, so this might have been a moment for him to get away from all those students. Now, brush and ink. Now, that was a pen and ink we just looked at, with the brush doing the wash. Brushes with ink can produce a wide range of effect, and with the brush and ink, there's very much an East and West tradition, and we're going to talk about the Western tradition first. This is Henri Matisse's Dahlia's Pomegranates and Palm from 1947. And it produces, bold, he produced bold and broad strokes and also very delicate fine lines. Um, you can really, you know, um, it's composed of primary lines, which is this linear quality is very much part of the Western tradition in drawing. But, um, there's less subtlety that you get with the paints and uh, shadowing. Pastels, although, in chalk, you do some of that, but when you get into painting techniques, you get, you get more range in tones. Of course, you're also working in one color. It's essentially monochromatic, although he does manage to suggest um, some different aspects. So, okay, we're gonna talk about the liquid media in Asia. And um, goodness gracious, um, the here is just a magnificent scroll. It's a hanging scroll, um, and you ha it's important to remember or to acknowledge that in Asia, calligraphy, handwriting is an art form. We had a demonstration in Kansas by a Zen monk who came in, and he set up his pad. And it wasn't very big, it was maybe a five by seven, and his ink and his brush. And the calligraphic line, it starts thin, it widens and tapers to the end. And it's very much an art form in Asian traditions. And then you do not pick your pen up until you have finished your line. And that's what this artist did, this, this monk. He, you know, he started, and it was all calligraphy. It was all I mean, if characters from their alphabet, and he would, you know, create them. And he did not pick the brush up until it was finished. Good, bad, or indifferent. When it it was what it was when it was completed. It is very typical in the Asian tradition to combine text with an image. Typically, it's poetry. These were produced by scholarly artists who kind of retreated from the court. This is a time when you had courtly painters who were doing very elaborate compositions for the emperor and his court. 
and the scholars, the educated, they kind of retreat to um, the countryside and they write poems and have the tea ceremony. And thank you, Leah, she brought me a glass of water um, and created these beautiful compositions and they did not sell them. They were not to be sold. Um, that was very important. And they were gifts and all these stamps, these red marks you see, um, they are ownership marks, um, maybe the artist, but maybe not. Um, perhaps if we visited the particular scholar at his, at his studio in the 1372, um, and we might watch him create this image or finish it up probably. And then um, if we were very fortunate, he might gift it to us. So we might add our stamp this has obviously been passed down and all these various stamps are various people in ownership. Again, the combination of landscape, this vertical composition and the poem up above, I, would, I don't read um, Japanese, I mean Chinese, excuse me, but I uh, firmly believe that it's a poem about the landscape we see because that interconnectedness was very important. And again, your pen, is very unforgiving, you can't erase, so your marks are what you you have. So it's a very precise, very careful, often a very slow process. And, and again, um, added the difficulty added of the composition of coins. So I think that's it for drawing. Do we have questions? And it's about right. We're right at 30 minutes, which is where I'd like to keep it because we've learned that Zoom learning is in, is more intense than sitting in a lecture hall. So anybody have a question? Want to say hi? Want to tell me what you're doing during COVID? <laughs> Hello, I have, I have a, a question. This is Bernadette. Um, in the Asian traditional artwork, um, I, I was doing that some years ago I started doing it and in a book that I was learning from they started from the bottom of like let's say they were drawing a bamboo um, shoot then it would be starting at the bottom and go up is that pretty common for most yes, Asians? I think so there, it's you know it, it, it has Probably, I would say the Asian tradition has a few more rules than, you know, I mean, in the Western tradition, we can be much more freeform, you know. Um, landscape, they are, I mean, it's very rare to see. Uh, certainly, if you do see a figure, it's, it's very small, very distant. The, the land is probably the focus of the paintings. Now, of course, this is the 14th century. You know, traditions will change. But, yes, you're right. You would start, you know, and like I said, you don't pick that pen up until you finish what you're creating. Right. Good question. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, yes, Janet here. Uh, I happen to have a little book. I've had it for several years. It's called The Chinese Brush Painting Bible by Jane Dwight. And it shows different things you can do. And it shows you the, the movements you should make to make a character or an very, item. It's very precision. I mean, it's very precise. You know, you study a long time to create something that, it's just lovely. You know, that looks very quick to me, you know. Thanks. Thank you. Is everyone staying safe, please? I hope. Everyone's See, we have lots home. of artists and I know that, uh, uh, We've had a basic drawing class. Uh, I'm surprised there aren't more questions. Just as an aside for myself, would do you think historically charcoal was probably the first thing that people drew with? Mm. Yeah, that or chalk. I mean, you know, the cave paintings, you know, they're very, very sophisticated. Um, I actually think there's a good chance that body art tattooing may have been the very, very first art. Uh, I didn't think about I that. Think just marking a tool, you know, this is Sandra's tool, don't touch it kind of thing. I, I think ownership 
belonging to a group, I think that's where the idea of marking things. But you look at those elaborate and intense K paintings, and some of them are primarily charcoal or monochromatic. I'm thinking of the lionesses in particular. Um, they, you know, they that was a very, I mean, they were hunting mammoths, huge animals with hand axes, stone hand axes. You know, it was a very difficult life. It was the end of an ice age. They were at least semi nomadic. And to and we know they didn't live in the caves that they put art in. So there was a distinct, I mean, it's just there's something about humankind that we are compelled to create imagery. Um, what that is, I don't know, but I think it's fascinating. Um, and that's why I think. I mean, we live in a very visual world in the 21st century, very much so. A lot of Im information is conveyed very quickly. You know, I always would have my students, if it were you know, the spring session, I'd have them um, watch Super Bowl commercials because, you know, 30 seconds cost millions of dollars. So how much information do they compact visually you know, you turn off the sound and watch the image and still gain a lot of information. And some students understood that better than others, but um, I was trying to teach them that it's not, you know, oh, political ads. Gosh, they're, you know, and we're getting ready to hit that season. And uh, when I lived in Kansas, our, I lived in um, eastern Kansas. I was at Lawrence's in the eastern part of the state. And Missouri, very close to Missouri, all of our television came from Missouri, so I was there for a presidential election year, and let me tell you, every commercial was a political one, and it was fascinating to watch how they combine images to tell you something other than the straight verbal message, and, you know, you can entertain yourself that way. <laughs> Would you like me to stop sharing your screen so that you can see everyone in class? That'd be great, because we're finishing the lecture for today. We'll start painting tomorrow. Okay, if you I see a little button up in the corner that says gallery view, then you can see everyone. I see everybody already. I've got to Awesome. Know. We had a couple of comments. A good overview. I learned a lot. Thanks. And someone said, enjoyed the lecture very much. Informative and interesting. Oh, that's lovely to hear. Um, you know, there are more. I mean, I hit the highlights. I mean, we could spend, you know, we could, especially in printing, we could get off into some very esoteric things. But not, they don't come up often, and I want to just, you know, if you go into a gallery, I mean, I think in printmaking, understand the difference between the line produced by an engraving and the line produced by an etching. I see Janet nodding. I know she's a printmaker, so she uh, she understands it makes a very different, and they're very produced in a very different way. And um, and and when you see the color block, the Japanese color blocks, that just the complicated when you understand how complicated the technique is, and we'll look at that, that's, that comes after um, painting. I think we'll, um, I, I, uh, I enjoy teaching this to students because it gives you an, a deeper understanding, you know, understanding that, you know, when, you do, when you're using a pencil, you can erase. If you're using an ink pen, you know, all of you, I mean, that's why we start kids out with pencils, right? You know, when we're teaching them to write, we don't give them an ink pen because, you know, Sandra, you just said something that made me think about real quickly, the charcoal and um, uh, chalks are really early. Erasers, the creation of rubbers is late. So how did early artists with charcoal and pen do you know, that? You know? Other than Why? just rub their finger and rub it in? Or, or water, you know, I mean, you know, water's a life source and it's not by accident that the, the earliest civil, settled civilizations grow up around rivers, major rivers, the Nile, the Euphrates and um, the, the Ganges in India, you know, fresh water is very important to survival and if you're going to grow crops too. So, but they were creating art long before we had settled communities and agriculture. You know, they were hunters and gatherers. Um, if you came to my women art class, we talked about the cave paintings and, you know, the artist handprints. 
and someone analyzed um it's not a hundred percent correlation but women's fingers and men's fingers is about a 65 to 70 percent you can you can look at their finger lengths and and the relationship to each other and make a good guess at gender and this fellow um looked at some of those cave paintings for the first time and you know and said wait a minute you know, there's a lot of women artists here you know and no one had thought about that before but you know um it would make sense. Women were the gatherers, so they stayed closer to home because they had children. That's an alarm. Uh, for, it was about time to stop for questions but and discussion. But um, so we still have a few minutes. It's just, you know, I, I wanted to make sure I didn't keep talking and y'all got to ask some questions. But yeah. I'm going to ask um, Bernadette to unmute herself. She has her hand electronically raised. Um, Go ahead. I have a question regarding, I've never heard of those crayons that are mixed with, I, I, what is the substance that's mixed with those crayons? Um, um, well, it's usually, the, the, I mean, if you think Conte? about it, is it the Conte? Wax. Um, you know, the Conte, you know, I can't say, for example, be honest with you, um, but I will find out next time and I will have a, a, a more specific answer for you, Bernadette. Um, Gum Arabic makes a lot of things. A lot of times they mix gum Arabic and other materials to make them. Um, you know, of course, they're all commercially made today. Yes, ma'am. Anne? I think Conte is mixed with wax. Thank you. Um, I think the, the amount of wax, you know, and of course, Conte doesn't have a lot of colors, you know, red, black, white, um, whereas Crayola Crayon. Yeah. Know. Um, we're getting that okay. six was it 68 the big box of crayons what a treat that was you know i think it's okay. lovely that flesh crayola and they've become more inclusive that the flesh tone isn't just the color of caucasian skin but they have a big variety for flesh tones now because there's a huge variety in humanity so, anyway. go ahead ann Oh, okay. Um, Conte uh, has a lot less wax than a Crayola. For yes. those who might wonder if you say, you know, oh, what's the difference? It is, um, it's a, a really interesting thing to try. You can get it at Hobby Lobby or anything. Yeah. If, yeah. If a little kit with the three pieces right. and the three colors she's talking about. Right. And it's, it's really fun to play with if you right. are so inspired. But um, they Conte also in the has expanded in the current time and does um, make many many colors. Oh, does uh, it? Well, thank you. Yeah, You're you can. But asked. you can get it like you would get a box of pastels. Yeah. But it's um, not easy to as easy to blend as a pastel pencil. Pastels are lovely. That's yes. Lovely. They, boy, those yeah. are challenging. Yes. If we were physically in a classroom, I probably would bring some of these things and let y'all, you know, scribble on a piece of paper and see what they're like. Um, we probably couldn't do that with engraving, you know, but um, or etching. But you know, for pencils, geez, you know, like I said, if you've been put on hold and doodle, you draw. I mean, actually, hand a child a pencil, a piece of paper, some crayons, you know. It, it's only as adults we get inhibited to, oh, that's not good enough. And it has a real quick question, I think. Yes. Uh, yes. What about mixing the media, the drying and the oh, liquid? Definitely. I didn't get into that. I mean, collage is actually under the drawing, you know, techniques because they mix, you know, collage. Um, you know, but um, we don't, you know, I, I have to, you know, trying to keep it to the majority, the things you're gonna see the majority of, you know, and I mean, gosh, mixed media is a huge chapter just in and of itself in an art textbook today. And it's very common. And I, one of the things I, I do enjoy, I mean, um, I was listening, watching a thing on Facebook and they were talking about Crystal Bridges. And I don't know if y'all been up there, but there's a, a quite large piece and it's shoestrings and she colored she strings and she does the outline of we the people like in the constitution you know that the preamble and it's not finished because once again the constitution our constitution is never finished we're always looking at it and 
the Supreme Court makes a decision and whoops, here we go again, we're interpreting it again. And, and I think that was, you know, I, I understand the arguments about the strict interpretation and the very liberal interpretation, but I really think our founding fathers intended it to be something that evolved over time because they could not have predict, predicted the internet. I mean, you know, they we were, have time for one more question. And I noticed that Gil Caver has his microphone unmuted if he wanted to yes, make Gil. a comment or have a question. Go I ahead, Gil. On forever, so. Hi, Gina. What would be the simplest medium for an artist to start out with that's Pencil. foolproof? You know, you, you spend the least amount of money. You can, you can go to Michael's and spend well under $10 and pick up some good quality pencils and some good quality paper and take off. Um, you don't have to think about um, color as much, you know, making that shading can be become very difficult. You know, I think a good way to start out would be pencil. So. Thank you. Well, we appreciate everyone coming to class today and we appreciate Sandra coming to teach and we look forward to the other three weeks that she's going to share different art techniques or techniques in art with us. And uh, I know you all can see her enthusiasm for this subject as I can and appreciate it very much. So uh, next, if you feel like moving, we have Tai Chi coming up at 11. <laughs> so if you feel like getting up and moving. Be safe. Be yes. Be safe, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, are you going to take me out? I'll, I'll help you out. Yeah, thank you. I think. <laughs>